Hi everybody. I hope everybody's doing well at home. I am going to try to see if we can finish our lab. Even though you guys don't get to be in the classroom to do it, I wanted to show you how it would have uh, played out if we had actually been in this week. So um, let me remind you which lab we're looking at. Um, there's the uh, handout that you received for the lab and our lab journals we set up look something like this. And we made a first data table, which uh, looked like that. And I'll put these things up a little bit later so that people can copy them down if they were absent on those days. And we made a second data table, which looked like this. So I just wanted to remind you about the setup. And we're going to now talk a little bit about the procedure itself. We're going to do what the day two procedure describes in this lab handout. And if you remember, we stored a whole bunch of vials in the refrigerator that um, look kind of like this. And most of those are clear as a bell, and they're ready to go ahead and synthesize that fuel, which I explained before is basically just hand sanitizer. So let me show you how that procedure works. So the first thing I've done is to mass the empty container. I'm going to go ahead and add just about 10 mils of the calcium acetate stuff that we synthesized last week, which has been in the fridge. And the exact amount doesn't matter. Um, I'm just going to estimate about 10 mils. That'll be enough, hopefully, for some gel to start to form. And the alcohol that we're going to add is the methanol, which we dyed green. Let's see if we get a gel uh, when we add it. It takes just a minute to start, but it looks like it's working. I see a little bit. There we go. That's the effect we wanted, and that's essentially our hand sanitizer and uh, our, or our canned heat, our camping fuel. And you can see it's definitely kind of a jelly. Um, and that's our next step. That's the fuel that we're going to test the efficiency of. The next thing we'd want to do before we actually light the stuff on fire is to record the mass of the dish and the fuel together. And the dish and the fuel mass together was 119.56. Now those numbers, I'll show you what they look like in the data table in a minute. They go in the column for methanol, but first let's go ahead and test how well this fuel burns. All right, let's uh, light the fuel. We're going to record temperature every minute for 10 or 12 minutes and we'll just slide this out for a moment and this is what we would have been doing this week after putting the uh, fuels away you can see that's burning nicely although it's kind of hard to see the flame and definitely feel it there and we would let that burn let's see what it looks like with the lights out definitely a little bit easier to see that uh, we're heating up the water and like I said we'd record temperature every minute for 10 or 12 minutes and I'll show you what the data looks like. The other thing we're going to do when we're done is um, extinguish it and measure the mass of fuel that remains. Um, so essentially just the uh, just the ashes and record that mass in the data table. All right so here's the data that I spoke about earlier. You saw me write these two numbers down before the mass of the empty dish, the mass of the dish, and the fuel before we lit it. And this is the mass of just the ashes in the dish, so to speak. The fuel remaining um, and the uh, ashes in the dish combined with the mass of the dish. So of course subtracting this number from the empty dish mass would give us the mass of just the ashes remaining. Subtracting this mass from the empty dish mass would give us the amount of fuel that we started with. The difference between these two masses is, of course, the mass of fuel burned, which is a number we're going to want to use in order to calculate the theoretical number of kilojoules of energy that should have been released. Now, you'll see that this data corresponds to the methanol fuel, but our objective was to compare two fuels. This data corresponds to the ethanol fuel, and I'm not going to bother demonstrating that since the procedure is essentially the same. 
but if we had been in this week, then I would have had each lab group do a different fuel and then compare their data. Um, this is a good time to pause the video and jot these numbers down in your lab journal and make this data table if you didn't get a chance to do it last week. Um, before I go on to the next data table, which is going to show you how the temperature of the water changed over time. Okay, here's the data table which shows temperature over time. I'm going to try to speak a little louder. I was noticing that the uh, volume is not quite what it should be. Um, this is the data table that we made the other day. It looked like this, I think, when I was showing you how to do it underneath the document camera last week. There's the actual data that I'm going to give you as sample data. One for the methanol fuel, one for the ethanol fuel. So go ahead and pause the video and jot down the numbers. We're going to be making a graph of temperature versus time. That graph will have two lines in it, one for methanol and one for ethanol. And you'll want to either use colored pencils or a key to label which graph is which. And that will be part of our analysis to determine which of these fuels um, would be more effective. All right, so we've finished data collection. Let's go on to data analysis. There's six calculations we're going to go through here. The first two come from your data table and just some simple subtractions. The mass of fuel before we did anything um, is going to be calculated by taking the mass of the dish and the fuel together and subtracting the mass of the dish. When I do that for the sample data that um, I gave you before, I get 23.62 grams. Next, the mass of the fuel after we burned it, and that's basically ashes and maybe some fuel that wasn't burned, is going to be the mass of the dish and the fuel finally, minus the mass of the empty dish. And the difference there I got is only 2.19 grams. Now, the difference between those two numbers is, of course, the amount of fuel that we burned, and that is 21.43 grams. I'm going through these calculations for the methanol fuel so that you can do the same calculations for the ethanol fuel. In other words, for this first trial, all of our calculations are going to be the same, but you're going to be on your own for the calculations involving ethanol, which you have data for in the data table. Let's finish going through the methanol calculations and see what questions four, five, and six are all about. Question number four is asking for how many moles of alcohol we burn. Notice here the number of uh, the amount of alcohol burned is given in grams, and we want to convert that to moles by using the molar mass of alcohol. The alcohol I should specify in this case is the methanol, not the ethanol. There's the chemical formula for methanol and its molar mass. So I've converted from grams of methanol burned to moles of methanol burned. Question number five asks you for the amount of heat that theoretically should have been released based on the energy of combustion of ethanol, which is written at the top of the lab handout. And if you remember, we wrote some balanced chemical equations at the outset of this lab, which incorporated heat energy as a product in that reaction. And at the top of that page, it explains the number of kilojoules of energy, which is associated with burning one mole of methanol, is 715 kilojoules. So you can see here, I've used that as a conversion factor. Moles of methanol cancel, and I'm left with kilojoules of energy. So one mole of methanol would produce 750 kilojoules of energy. This is about two-thirds of a mole of methanol, and so it's produced about two-thirds of that amount of energy. Last but not least, we want to see how much energy the water actually absorbed. And if you remember, looking at our apparatus here, the water was absorbing most of that heat. However, a lot of the heat was probably absorbed by the air in the room. A lot of the heat was probably absorbed by that ring support, that wire gauze in the beaker itself. So don't be surprised when we see a value for heat absorbed by the water much less than the value we just calculated in question number five. So you can see in question number six, we're calculating how much heat must have been absorbed by the water. A correction that I made from the lab procedure here is I heated up 200 grams of water, not 100 grams of water like the procedure calls for. So please make a note of that. The mass of water we were heating was 200 grams. The specific heat capacity of water, of course, is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. If you look at the data table we wrote down second, 
the total temperature change as the water was heated from 21 degrees all the way up to 70, that means a 49 degree temperature change, final minus initial, or maximum minus minimum. And with that temperature change and these other values uh, plugged into this equation, we can calculate how much energy was absorbed by the water. Notice when I do that calculation, my answer is in joules because grams and degrees Celsius cancel. However, I want to compare it to this number in kilojoules. So we're going to do a joule-kilojoule conversion by dividing 40,964 joules by 1,000 to get 40.9 kilojoules. You'll notice that out of the 400 or so kilojoules that were released, only about 40 were actually absorbed by the water. Most of the heat was actually absorbed by the air, the metal ring, and the beaker itself. So probably somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the heat which is released is actually absorbed. And that's how we're going to calculate um, percent efficiency, is how much of the heat that theoretically is produced by the burning fuel actually gets absorbed by the water. So the last question in data analysis asks for percent efficiency. We're going to calculate that this way. The amount of heat absorbed by the water, the small number we just calculated, divided by the amount of heat released by the fuel, or the amount of heat that should have been theoretically released, that ratio times 100 will give us percent efficiency. You can see how I've calculated it here. In the lab handout, there's a typo which accidentally flips this ratio, so please use this correct ratio here. It's the small number, which is the numerator. A very small amount of heat was absorbed by the water, even though theoretically the fuel released much more heat than that. Notice all of these calculations are simply for the methanol fuel. And what I'm asking you guys to do is to calculate for the ethanol fuel each of those values. And you can use this template as an example. But in your lab journal, I should see both calculations. Um, one set of calculation for the methanol fuel, just like I've gone through here. One set of calculations for the ethanol fuel, um, which you can use the given data to complete. Also in data analysis, a graph showing temperature as a function of time for both fuels. Make two lines on the same graph and label them clearly. And then follow conclusion writing guidelines and uh, the prompt, which is in the handout. Um, this is an interesting experiment, and so I appreciate your patience as I try to figure out some of the intricacies of you know, webcasting a lab like this. And um, we're going to post some details about how we can upload a um, version of your lab journal online next week, but I wanted to give you the information you need to finish this lab in journals like we had hoped to do yesterday and today if we were in the classroom. Um, best of luck with everything, and uh, we'll stay in touch in classroom. Um, and of course, you should email me if there's any questions I can answer, and we'll have some more information in the coming week about how we can meet up online and uh, have live discussions about all of this content. All right, that's all I've got in this video. We'll see you next time, guys.